Welcome to Deconstructing, where I take apart an iconic horror movie to find out what makes it tick. <laughs> horror master Wes Craven gave us plenty of nightmares through the decades, but in the early 80s he was inspired to create a story where the nightmare itself is the monster. Please God. This is God. In today's episode, we're going to explore that history, and as always, we'll be following the deconstructing rule of threes. With Origin, I'll dig into Craven's real-life inspirations for his most enduring monster, Freddy Krueger. In Legacy, we'll go forward in time to catch the wave of Freddy mania that smashed pop culture for years to follow. And finally, we have Mystery, where I'll spotlight some obscure and straight-up creepy legends, fan theories, and trivia surrounding one of the most iconic horror franchises of all time. So start brewing that coffee, because we're pulling an all-nighter to deconstruct Wes Craven's 1984 classic, A Nightmare on Elm Street. There are many stories behind the origins of Craven's sixth feature, and a few contradict each other. The most widely accepted version starts with a series of articles in the LA Times, each reporting mysterious deaths among Asian refugees who fled to the US in the 1970s. Craven was intrigued by two common elements in these cases. First, each of the victims reported having horrific nightmares to the point where they refused to sleep, and second, few of them had any knowledge of the others. The Times made no connection between the cases, but Craven saw the pattern, which led him to draft the story of multiple people sharing the same deadly dream. All he needed was a supernatural boogeyman to prowl the dreams of his victims, and he found him in his own childhood fears. When Wes was a boy, he once saw a strange old man silently shuffling past his bedroom window one night and was terrified when the man turned to glare at him. He also recalled a boy who used to torment him at school, a sadistic bully named Fred Krueger. Craven had previously name-checked that bully in his first horror film, Last House on the Left, but shortened the villain's name to Krug. Craven also wanted to expand on the tropes of the slasher trend that peaked in the early 80s, with young protagonists battling the ultimate anti-parent who seeks to terrorize and destroy children instead of protecting them. But when he completed his script, no studio was interested in developing it. It finally found a home at New Line Cinema, which began as a distributor of independent and foreign titles, as they were just dipping their toes into the production world. Next, Craven set about finding the perfect embodiment for Kruger. Rejecting the concept of a masked killer, which was pretty much the status quo for slasher movies, he decided Freddy's face should be uncovered but horribly disfigured. Hence the backstory of his death by fire at the hands of Elm Street parents avenging the murders of their children. Next came choosing the right actor to bring Freddy to life. Oddly enough, Robert Englund, already a familiar face to genre fans by then, wasn't on Craven's list because he didn't seem threatening enough. But when Englund showed up for auditions with slick back hair and dark eye makeup, Craven realized Freddy would look scarier as a normal-sized man with shifty, sleazy mannerisms. As you know, A Nightmare on Elm Street exploded at the box office. New Line missed premiering the film on Halloween, but that didn't hurt its reception one bit. New Line Cinema became a major player in the genre almost overnight, and the franchise raked in so much revenue the studio earned the nickname The House That Freddy Built. Of course, they immediately set their sights on a sequel. <laughs> Despite negative reviews, Nightmare 2 turned an even bigger profit, and before long, the franchise included eight films, a series of original novels and comic books, a spin-off anthology TV series, video games, Freddy Halloween costumes, and an avalanche of other merchandise. Yes, I know there was a remake, and frankly, I don't care. Ten years after the original, Craven returned to the director's chair for New Nightmare. Breaking the franchise mold, the film brings back England, Heather Langenkamp, John Saxon, and Wes Craven as themselves for one of the first metafictional horror films to flip the script on slasher tropes, an approach that would really click for Craven two years later with Scream. As with any film that blurs the lines between dreams and reality, A Nightmare on Elm Street raises a lot of question marks. Huh? I am your boyfriend now, Nancy. 
Over the years, countless Freddy fans have taken it on themselves to explore some of the franchise's unanswered mysteries. Well, I guess those people don't wake up to tell what happens. Let's get a closer look. By now, we can't imagine anyone besides Robert Englund embodying the role of Freddy Krueger. He's arguably one of the last horror superstars, so it's hard to believe Craven once thought he was the wrong type for the part. Craven originally conceived Freddy as a massive figure, and to that end he approached actor and stunt performer Kane Hodder, who would later step into the role of Jason Voorhees in the Friday the 13th franchise. It would have been an even wilder coincidence if Hodder had played opposite England in the crossover hit Freddy vs. Jason, but in that film, Jason was played by Ken Kurtzinger. The iconic lullaby that foreshadows Freddy's arrival was in the script from the beginning. Craven based it on the children's jump rope rhyme, One, Two, Buckle My Shoe, but composer Charles Bernstein didn't actually write the melody for it. That came from another musician, Alan Pasqua, who happened to be Heather Langenkamp's fiancé at the time. Believe it or not, Freddy's trademark weapon wasn't part of the original concept. Instead, Craven envisioned him carrying a scythe, but as he was studying monsters of ancient mythology, he kept coming back to the archetype of a beast with deadly claws. When he observed his cat unsheathing its own set of claws, Craven decided to adapt a man-made version of that natural weapon. We get our first look at the glove during the opening titles, where Freddy is shown building it in his boiler room lair. The hands that you see in these shots are actually those of special effects designer Charles Berlardinelli, who built the original piece in very much the same way. He also came up with a practical way for the knives to strike sparks. He just hooked them up to a car battery. The main glove, or hero glove, made of steel and brass, was so heavy it pulled Robert Englund's shoulder down, giving him the posture of a gunslinger. Craven liked this pose so much, he told Englund to make it part of Freddy's swagger. Before his film career took off, Craven was an English teacher at Westminster College in Pennsylvania, where he introduced his students to the works of William Shakespeare. So it seems fitting he would later incorporate a passage from Hamlet into this creepy classroom dream sequence. Here's the complete text. One of the movie's most shocking moments is the death of Johnny Depp's character, Glenn. This revolving room, also used for Tina's death scene, was set to drop 500 gallons of red water on cue, but it turned the wrong way, unloading the water onto live stage lights and electrical cables. Thankfully, no one was injured, as far as we know. Finally, let's not forget that goofy, tacked-on epilogue that Craven himself didn't even like. <laughs> This alternate ending shows how it might have gone, with Freddy hijacking the kid's ride. Nancy's mom is unharmed in this version, but it's her oblivious smile that makes it much creepier. Still awake? I hope so, because we'd like to hear your views on the OG Nightmare on Elm Street. Like, do you think it's an official sequel to Last House on the Left? Yeah, some fans actually claim that. Tell us what you think, but before you go, be sure to like this video and ring the bell to subscribe for more original Joe Blow horror content. This whole thing is just a dream. So fuck off.